Welcome to Hindu Analysis, August 11, 2018. So today we are going to see all these articles. The first article is Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve enters UNESCO list. So uh, this Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve is the highest biosphere reserve in our country. So it is the third highest mountain peak in the world. And this Kanjanjanga peak, which is the third highest peak in the world of 8000 meter is in this Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve. So what the reason news is, the UNESCO's International Coordinating Council of Man and Biosphere Reserve Program declares this Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve as the world network of biosphere reserve. So if any biosphere reserve is going to get included in this world network of biosphere reserve then what could be the positive impacts on those biosphere reserve in the sense it positively promotes a lot of collaborative research on the flora fauna and every species which is present in those reserve as well as it promotes the tourism so the in India we have totally 18 biosphere reserves as of now and the first one to be included in this world network of biosphere reserve is this Nilgiri biosphere reserve and the last one to be get entered into this world network of biosphere reserve is Agastya Malai Biosphere Reserve in Kerala in 2016. So after that this Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve is getting included in this UNESCO list. So uh, as we said earlier there are 18 biosphere reserve out of which 11 biosphere reserves are declared as of now as world network of biosphere reserve. So this Kanjanjanga is in Sikkim you see here right so this is that Kanjanjanga biosphere reserve. So it contains core area, buffer zone as well as the transition zone. So this Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve is one of the highest ecosystem in the world. Being included in this world network of biosphere reserve, it boosts the unique ecosystem which is present in those biosphere reserve. So it also promotes the research in that reserve as well as it increases the tourism. Sikkim normally has a population of 6 lakh but by means of this, every year Sikkim has nearly 15 lakh tourists. So it also boosts the tourism. So Kanjanjanga National Park which is present inside in the core area of the Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve is India's first mixed world heritage site. So 86% of the core area in that reserve is alpine zone and the remaining area is Himalayan wet temperate and subtropical moist deciduous forest. So all the world's 34 biodiversity hotspots have a uh, lot of uh, species diversity as well as lot of species which are endemic to those uh, areas. So similarly Kanjanjanga also have lot of uh, species varieties including 4500 species of flowering plants including uh, the plants which have medicinal uh, medicinal values, the rhododendrons and the species of primulus and oaks. So many species which are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act, those species are also present in this area. So if you see here, there are a lot of animals and birds which are endemic to this uh, Kanjanjanga Biosphere Reserve. For example, red panda, snow leopard, etc. are the animals in those reserve and uh, monal pheasants and uh, the blood pheasants. These are all the birds which are present in the Sikkim area. So this blood pheasants is the state bird of Sikkim. So if you see here in this pic, these are all the 18 uh, biodiversity hotspots in our country. So the second article is Pakistan hopes to host SARC summit. So recently Pakistan leader Imran Khan met uh, Indian High Commissioner which shows his uh, positive commitment towards improving the relationship between India and Pakistan. So what is the news here is the 19th SARC summit would be held soon in Pakistan in November 2019. So this is the news. So first we have to know about what this SARC is. SARC is uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. So it contains South Asian countries. If you see here it contains Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, Maltese and Bangladesh. So these are all the SAR countries. So it is very strategically important in terms of geostrategic as well as geoeconomic perspective. So this SAR countries have eight countries so which constitute 3% of world's area and 21% of world's population and 2.8% of global economy. So this SARC has the potential to uh, emerge as a global leader in the future which is in parallel with the European Union. So this SARC countries constitute around 8 countries with the two nuclear uh, countries which is India and Pakistan. So what is the aim of this SARC is basically to increase the mutual trust among the countries in the South Asian region and in also uh, it focuses 
on increasing the socio economic cultural and technological development and information sharing among these countries the 18th sark summit was held at kathmandu in nepal in november 2014 similarly the next 19th sark summit was supposed to be held on november 2016 which was to be hosted by pakistan but india cancelled its participation in that 19th sark summit due to the uri attack of 2016 so india didn't participate similarly uh, all other countries also uh, cancelled its participation in the 19th sark summit so that is only now going to be held in uh, november 2019 so this uh, uri attack is one of the deadliest attack on our indian security forces by the pakistani terrorist group jaish e muhammad uh, in the town uri which is in jammu and kashmir so because of that we neglected to participate in the 19th sark summit which was supposed to be held in november 2016 so now it get postponed to november 2019 and it will be uh, held only in pakistan so pakistan is going to host this 19th sark summit the issues discussed by pakistan leader and our high commissioner were th these two the bilateral issues between india and pakistan which is the kashmir issue and second one is how to stop the terrorism and the cross border infiltration between the india and pakistan so what is the way forward here is uh, we should call for better ties between india and pakistan and we should stop this blame game over each other and we should resumption of the talks between india and pakistan so to bring some positive changes in the relationship between india and pakistan so the next article is india to triple the ethanol production by 2022 so recently prime minister narendra modi on world's biofuel day which was on august 10 he stated that india is going to triple its ethanol production by 2022 as well as it is going to set up 12 modern refineries for the production of advanced biofuel in our country so what is this ethanol blending means uh, the ethanol which is produced from the biofuels is blended with the petrol in order to reduce the consumption of the petrol and increase the consumption of the biofuels so as of now government is planning to blend 10% of ethanol to petrol by 2022 and 20% of ethanol to be blended to petrol by 2030 so this is the actual target but what really existing is only 2% of ethanol is blended with the petrol so this is a, a concern which was right so by ministry of petroleum and natural gas want why we wish to blend this ethanol to the petrol in the sense 5% of blending of ethanol to petrol replaces 1.8 million barrels of crude oil so which in turn reduces the need for the import of those uh, crude oil or the petroleum from the other countries so it reduces the imports obviously so this uh, ethanol if in case it is blended with the petrol it reduces the vehicular emission it reduces the carbon dioxide carbon monoxide as and it reduces the hydrocarbon so it also reduces the import burden on the crude petroleum which we import from other countries so that crude petroleum is the major source or from which the normal petrol is produced this ethanol is a particulate free burning fuel it is a by product of the sugar industry so what is the process of this uh, ethanol uh, manufacturing in the sense so ethanol is of two types one is the natural another one is the synthetic synthetic ethanol okay so this natural ethanol is produced from the glucose which is derived from the uh, sugar which is derived from sugar cane uh, as well as from the cellulose as well as from the starch so these are all the raw materials from which the natural ethanol is derived by means of the fermentation process so similarly this synthetic or artificial ethanol is derived from the coal or gas which are non renewable resources this blending of ethanol with petrol reduces the dependence on cng import from other countries it also uh, help to fight the climate change and it helps the sugarcane farmers to raise their income by means of this fermentation process from which this natural ethanol is derived from and in that uh, meeting itself prime minister narendra modi uh, he launched a web portal which is called parivesh which is a single window for environmental wild wildlife forest and coastal regulation zone clearances in a simpler way uh, if you see here in this pic so this uh, sugar cane corn wheat grain everything are used as the raw materials from which this natural ethanol is created by means of fermentation process and it is then blended with normal petrol and it is fed to the vehicles so which in turn reduces the co2 emission or the greenhouse gas emissions in a, a very better way so as of now we are having four generations of uh, biofuel production the first one is 
the biofuels which are produced from the uh, crops which are eatables like wheat, sugar cane, maize, corn, etc. So the second one is uh, from the crops which are non-eatables like the food crops, waste, wood, etc. So the third one is uh, the biomass, the biofuels which are produced uh, by means of from the microorganisms like uh, specially cultured algae etc and the fourth one is uh, the biofuel production by means of carbon sequestration process uh, by means of which uh, capturing and storing the carbon under the ground so the fourth article is the indian bullfrog so it is this indian bullfrog which is the latest entrant in andaman's uh, 150 year old history of invasive which means there are a lot of species which are invaded in andaman and nicobar island so this uh, species uh, started spreading from entire andaman from the north andaman to uh, till this uh, little andaman and it now started spreading to the nicobar island also so this indian bullfrog is highly carnivorous and it is under schedule 4 of the indian wildlife act 1972 which means harming these these species could uh, lead to some uh, kind of penalties which are slightly lower than the schedule 1 and 2 of the Indian Wildlife Act 1972. So the other names for this Indian bullfrog is golden frog or green frog by uh, different different regions or islands in the Andaman uh, and Nicobar Island itself. So now this, uh, if you see in this pic, this is North Andaman, Middle and Lower Andaman and it is Little Andaman. So this Indian bullfrog is invading this entire Andaman and now it started spreading to the Nicobar Island. So what is the concern here is, it steadily occupies the entire island ecosystem as well as it threatens the local economy. So this uh, Indian bullfrog consumes the fish in the ponds, rivers and lakes in the Andaman Island as well as the chicks which is in the Andaman Island. So this... Uh, affects the food chain of the island as well as it threatens the local economy people where those people depend majorly on the fish and the chicks for their production or their livelihood. So already this Andaman Nicobar Islands resources are very scarce as well as there are a lot of uh, natural calamities which are frequently occurring. So amongst this uh, Indian bullfrog invasion causes or raises a major concern for the people uh, and the local economy. So the environmentalist uh, feels that this is also a living thing so the, we should find some way or other to live in harmony with the, all the species in the island. So one factual information here is the largest herbivore in the Andaman Nicobar Island is the Andaman wild pig. So the next article is IAP surges to 5 month high of 7%. So this IAP which is the index of industrial production is given by CSO which is central statistical organization for every six months and this IAP actually represents how fast or how slow the industrial production of an economy in a country is growing. So this uh, recent data shows that there is a 7% overall increase in the index of industrial production. But if you subcategorize it and see uh, what are the increase in each and every segment, then the primary goods uh, constitute around 9.28% increase in last June month. Similarly, the capital goods uh, an increase of 9.62% and infrastructure 8.53%. And if you see in case of consumer durables in the sense uh, like refrigerators, cars, mobile phones, etc. So that consumer durables witnessed a strong surge of nearly 13.1 percentage increase in the index of industrial production and consumer non-durables which is fruits, vegetables and uh, these kind of things. So they alone decrease which means this uh, index decreased by means of 0.47 percentage. So this is a slight concern among the industries. Usually this 2011-12 is the base year for the calculation of this index of industrial production and it was considered as 100 and and now uh, if it is 110 means then there is 10 percent increase in the industrial production if it is 120 means 20 percent increase similarly if it is 7 percent means 107 which in the sense 7 percent increase in the index of industrial productions which is taken place so this uh, increase this overall increase in the index shows that or it reflects the positive investment trend in our country in the manufacturing sector or the infrastructure sector as well as the railways affordable housing roadways etc so the next article is half a million Venezuelans fleeing crisis enter Ecuador. So uh, Ecuador on Wednesday declared the state of migration emergency due to the unusual migration of Venezuelans through the Colombia and into the Ecuador. So in Venezuela there is a hyperinflation and also there is
there is a uh, products shortages like food shortage, medicine shortage, etc. So this crisis is uh, increasing day by day. So only the people from there started migrating and entering into Ecuador. So in order to handle this situation, the Ecuador government on Wednesday declared this state of migration emergency. So nearly 5,47,000 Venezuelans entered Ecuador through this Colombia. So this uh, declaration of state of migration of emergency in the sense it is not sending back those migrants back to uh, Venezuela it is only to help them out to help mobilize more resources to help them and also deployment of doctors as well as the social workers to attend the migration needs so this Venezuelan migration is similar to the other migrations which has taken place in Asian countries like the Rohingya Muslims migration from the Myanmar to Bangladesh and the Bangladeshi Muslims migration from Bangladesh to Assam etc. So instead of viewing these migrants as illegal migrants and deporting them to their origin, the, all these countries should work together in tandem to deploy the humanitarian assistance to these migrants.